Hey everybody, welcome to the show today. I'm your host, Evan Evans, and uh, on my left is Dallas Crane. Hey, how you guys doing? Followed by Stephen Stratbear. Welcome everybody. And Kyle Uhas. Hello guys. And today we're going to do something that we always do, which is talk about scoring. <laughs> Perfect. Let's do it. <laughs> so I had a question for you, Evan. Um, I've been thinking about this uh, this past week, and how do you know when a cue is done? Like, how do you know when? Okay, this is this is what I want, or well, not necessarily what I want, but how do you know when to just yeah say okay, that's that's good. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. That goes down a pretty deep path too, <laughs> um, because. Um, you have to be a little bit cognizant of something called the artist's curse. Have you heard of this? So that's where, you know, um, a true artist is always learning from himself and is always improving. And so when you're working on something that takes a while, 30 days or more, and it's a large body of work or a large project or a deep project, by the time you are done with the project, you're mentally actually, uh, you've grown more. Hmm. You've learned from that experience, you have new perspective, there's some things you want to do better on possibly some of the early parts of when you started that long-term work, you know? And that's the kind of the artist's curse is that you're never really done. Hmm. And so by the time you get to the end, you know, you feel like you want to just redo the whole thing or mm -hmm. or whatnot. But, you know, uh, when you're film scoring, you've got potentially live sessions coming up. So, you know, when you're done, you, you've got to commit to it. And I think the best way to be able to do that is to just have a, a very large foundation of craft. So lots of techniques that you use. To make sure that the music that you just created at least is at a certain standard level that you had when you began the project and you realize okay at the end of this so has it met my sort of minimum standards that I had you know 30 days ago or 60 mm -hmm. days ago and and if so then you're done and you kind of got to let it go but that's part of the craft of film scoring is you have to, you only get those 30 days and you have to put everything that you have into it, you know, and then you can go on a vacation. <laughs> but for those 30 days, you need to you work as hard as you can to sort of oh, reach to yeah. certain creative levels that it needs to reach. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it helps to uh, compartmentalize your work too. So you start with like the musical, consider I guess even before the musical, the... Uh, the, the considerations of the cue, like uh, the narrative, you know, and as soon as you know you've tackled all the narrative uh, that you need in the music, then you go to the musical and you kind of fill it out and make it sound pretty and make it work, and then you're done, and so you know, you know, like when you're working on the musical side that you don't need to work on the narrative side at all, and then once you're done with the musical, you can work on the production side, so you're not going to change necessarily you know you're not going to write new melodies or anything but you're going to do the production editing and then mm -hmm. you know actually like client review and stuff so Dallas is exactly right like and, uh, and of course if the client has no further revision notes you know that's also an indication mm -hmm. that you've met those requirements but yeah if you start out with a lot of craft craft are sort of like pre-built techniques that you've already worked up it can even be art but you've turned them into craft so that you can just use them mm. If you have all those infused already baked in, then you already know that it's that it's you know met your latest standards. Mm -hmm. But you you might not you the better the artist, the more unhappy you are at the end, you know, <laughs> because you you keep learning. You can, some artists can be twice as good after every project. You know, it's phenomenal growth. You know, that's a really great trait to have is to learn from your experiences. So, are you saying that? Um it's it's okay because your next project might be better so don't worry if this one's not going to be good because you're going to keep developing and 
Well, I mean, even yeah. Stravinsky went back and he rewrote some of his works mm. later. You know, a mm -hmm. lot of composers do that. But uh, you can't do that in film scores. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you can always make a concert suite and then you can improve on some things. Hey, I always wished I had this, you know. A uh, um, friend of mine, John Massari, recently did a, a reimagining of his original score to Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Mm. Awesome. And he did that in yeah. concert live with orchestra, which originally wasn't with orchestra. It was with cool synthesizers and all that sounds. Mm. But he reimagined imagined it for orchestra so you know that was something that he probably always wanted to do and later he was able to do that in, in a concert setting and it's just just that wonderful actually, that actually reminds me of uh, castle in the sky um the uh, miyazaki film with uh, joe hisaishi doing the score the original like if you watch on the disc it'd be the the japanese dub it's like this old synthesizer score and then when i think disney got the studio ghibli collection they actually paid him to do like a full orchestration of that score so he totally redid it oh, and live played it and everything so you watch the English dub and it's great right but that's very unusual <laughs> yeah but you know so yeah exactly and that's kind of my point is that yeah. you know you've got to really rely on the fact that when you're done that's it historically done mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and who wants to work on the same thing for the rest of their life anyway <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah, like time to later. move on yeah, yeah. <laughs> sometimes you're just like begging the client to say yes so you can just be done with it oh yeah definitely <laughs> I'm curious because what Dallas but mentioned that doesn't was, work <laughs> <laughs> please, please please yeah but what Dallas mentioned was you kind of uh, compartmentalize uh, how you write like the narrative between the music like but I'm curious though because I, I feel like you still have to have some kind of idea what the narrative is at all times you know what I mean like so mm -hmm. we're kind of like where does that line maybe kind of set for you guys you know or where you know where is it at where well, you like well that begins in the spotting phase you okay know, you want to decide where you need a music in the project okay um, based on a certain purpose that the music's gonna bring okay. that that it's lacking perhaps narratively, you know? And so you sort of figure that out ahead of time. Okay, hey, we need to, you know, enhance this through line through the story um, because it's not super clear or we need to connect it or we need the audience to understand it's growing okay. or, you know, these... So you're solving problems even before you start, you know? Right, right. And that's really what you're doing anyway. I mean, before a movie's done, it just has tons of problems and everyone's just solving them. Exactly, <laughs> they're yeah, cutting it, they're right. putting special effects in, they're hiring, you know, all the different crew, they're, everyone's solving all of its problems, just a gigantic noodle soup of problems. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, uh, that's what happens when you come in as a composer. So you sort of got to create a plan, and that plan uh, attacks that issue. Okay. Okay. So just kind of setting aside, like, obviously spotting. So you're going through and you're seeing this, this, is, this is a problem area. We need to have some kind of transition here, you know. But at the same time, you are still like just keeping your, you know, for the most part, you're keeping your ideas just musical, say for a certain aspect, you're like just just focusing on the melody. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, at the same time, I understand this has to have a big action scene here. This is a big dramatic moment, but right, you know, like I said, you're you, how far I guess you know you kind of separate yourself from that. Like you know, I don't want to be totally driven by the narrative right now because I have a great musical idea that will fit perfectly. But at the same time, like, you still have to preserve that because you're still yeah. trying to well, tell a story too. Well, I, I personally teach that you know don't even think about the music. You know, really okay. Like, you know, okay, your musical, your great musical ideas are um, expendable. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you always have to serve the story. The 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 narrative, the storytelling. You always have to serve the storytelling because the you got to consider the audience. There's a whole reason movies exist is for the social aspect of it, and so that's why you exist too. Then you know, there's art music and there's concert music and there's concert art music, but then when you're writing for narrative scoring, that's a whole different ball of wax than just writing music for the sake of writing music or for art's sake or to have an exercise in a particular mode that you want to check out or okay. whatnot. Okay. You know, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, it, it's, it's like once you figure out the tempo, you're not going to be, you know, uh, mixing the cue and wondering, oh, I'm, should I change the tempo? Right, it, yeah. At that point, you know, you know, you already know what that's what it is. Yeah. So that's, that's, mm -hmm. It's nice to make decisions that mm -hmm. you can finalize, you know, mm -hmm. at, each, at each stage. Okay. I teach, I saying. teach, you know, the right ordering in order for you to, <laughs> to right. do all this kind of stuff. A lot of people think after they've started. Yeah, exactly. I don't teach that. <laughs> ah, <laughs> I teach yeah. think first and then just do. And then execute. Right, you know. Right. Yeah. Ah, a lot right. of people are kind of checking things out with their MIDI piano and everything and pulling up sounds and stuff. It's like, 
you know, that's not really going to get you to plan your landscape of what you're trying to do. <laughs> it's going to get the job done, and it's going to be possibly functional. Yeah. But it's not really going to hit that really planned out quality that, where everything's linked together and you have a big master plan going on. Right. Okay. Right. Think first, do afterward. You know. Okay. Once, once you're, once the way I teach, once you're writing the music, you, it's already written. As a matter of fact. You're just filling in blanks and just kind of putting in the note heads and okay. and uh, rendering the the music uh, and then mixing and conducting and mixing and, and getting that. It's all just project management after that. Uh, there's almost almost the entire film scoring process is project management. Right. The thinking right. part, you know, you don't have. There's not a lot that has to be spent. Not a lot of time that has to be spent in there. But if you if you do it if you don't do it first, uh, it's not going to come out. Right, and you're just going to be like stumbling over your own feet, or it's going to be similar to like kicking a hat that you're trying to pick up, and you just keep kicking <laughs> right, the hat. Yeah. Right, it makes sense because yeah, like even like you guys mentioned, you're going back and trying to figure out like, oh, I should change this now in the beginning, or I should go back and do this. You are. You're, I feel like you're constantly stopping yourself now, having to go back and fix something that you weren't happy with before, because you were kind of waiting for this aha moment, you know, in the middle of you know the actual project itself. So it's no, it's very true. Okay, it makes I, sense. It, it seems like the the aha moment is just. The expectation that at some point all you'll, all the decisions you make and finalize will be at the same moment. Right. But if you kind of divide up that aha across the different sure. stages, then okay. you get you know surety, kind of like little tiny ahas. That makes sense. It does. Mm-hmm. It does. Right. Do it okay. in the right order. Yeah, you probably see that a lot. You know, in composers who write with MIDI, is they're constantly blowing their wad too soon. Right. Right. You yeah. Know, it's like they're always blowing the right. It's always like you know full stimulation at all times. And uh, it just comes out kind of like flat because mm-hmm. there's not a lot of of building sculpting and, to right. it. Right. Sculpting in the narrative sense. Think because when you think before you com- write, and you're a film composer, the stuff you think about is not like music. It's sort of like function. Mm. What do I need to do here? Why? Mm. And when should it change? Why? And when yeah. should it change? Why? And <laughs> they're actually like, going to get there. They're like moments of music that, if you were to isolate them, they'd sound just really bad and ugly and obnoxious. But in the the narrative sense, they're you know they work perfectly. And it's hard to tell when you have this myopic view that you know these ugly moments are okay to have. Yeah, I think you it's know, you know, important to know the narrative. First and foremost, solve the narrative problems. Yeah. And if that's all you have time to do, and your score is just going to become functional, and but it's going to functionally solve all the narrative problems, man, you did great. You did job, right? But you know, you don't want to solve the narrative problems after you write the score and after you write the cues. Okay. Your music's going to be functional again and maybe even cool and great music and it's a great soundtrack, but you ruin the movie. Exactly. The movie's not moving the audiences. It's not helping the story where it needs to help. And you got a nice CD out of it and a (laughs) box office failure. Yeah, a flop movie. Yeah, exactly. Okay. You can kind of tell because... Like when the narrative is right, because when you add start adding stuff to it, it only gets better. And you can tell when the narrative is wrong, is that when you add stuff, it just doesn't help and you're not solving anything and you start bloating mm. it out of desperation. That reminds me of another thing, yeah. Like a lot of composers find like, man, where do you, how do you get motivation or inspiration? I'm like, I've been doing this scene for like two days now. And it's just like, I'm not finding any motivation. And that's because you haven't really realized the purpose if you realize the purpose of the music that you need to put into that into that moment, you'll be fully motivated because you know exactly what problem you need to solve. It's hard to write music for no purpose right. when you're a film composer. Hmm. You know, it's easy to do that when you're a classical composer because you're like, okay, I just gotta follow rondo form and I repeat my theme and you know, right. you know my motifs and everything, and I'm, there we go, I'm done. <laughs> it's a full suite, you know. But in movie scoring, the music is just like doesn't even matter. You know, the music is just like this extra art you can bring to the table above function. Um, but it's not necessary actually, and you can be a really great film composer and not even be using music to do it. Right. You know. Right. Um, there's even movies that don't need music, so it can get really. The box can really open up. You know, exactly. you don't want to get yourself in that music box. Okay. Okay. Uh, it doesn't know that makes a lot of sense. I feel like like they they focus so much on that you know musical quality, and you're right. They they forget about the narrative. They forget about the actual main purpose of the film itself or the you know TV show or whatever you're working on. So. 
Yeah. I was thinking earlier when you mentioned like the preparation aspect of this whole thing, and for some reason I thought of MMA. Uh, fighters and whatnot, and yes. like if you're not most fighters, they're preparing months in advance. They're getting their conditioning up and and they're practicing. They're sparring with other people. So if you come into the octagon yeah. like the day and you haven't done any of that, you're gonna get demolished. You're just <laughs> being, it's, and it's same with a composer. You got to do all that practicing and yes. preparation. And yeah. Uh, man, yeah, that's absolutely how, that's absolutely right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but it's it's years. Yeah, so like years of yeah. years of training. Yeah, and you bring that in. You bring all of your your tricks and your your goods, and, mm-hmm. and you can knock it. Knock There's it like out. a like generalized practice, which is you know like a general craft, orchestration, you know, instrumentation, composing, form, structure, and then there's like sp- specialized uh, preparation for the actual project. You know, that would be listening. Uh, learning about the cues mm-hmm. it would be uh, getting familiar with the instruments like the sounds but then also using the instruments maybe figuring out a technique that you need to use you know if, if your score is going to rely on some like synth garble something or other you should probably figure out how to do that before you write the score so that you can you know come in strong on the first cue that you write instead right, of you know right. kind of working your way in and halfway through the score you finally figure it out but there's no time go back to yeah. go back and okay make it work we do all these stuff. cues okay no, no, yeah, that does that makes a lot of sense you want some kind of um, blueprint some kind Francesco of Francesco Pinelli yeah. says hi from Italy and he says think first do it after I should it should be a mantra, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. 30 minutes every morning. <laughs> Eugene Hawley says, uh, looking forward to another informative session. Ernesto Aguirre says, this is a lot of great information. Oh, nice. nice. Very good. Thanks, guys. Thanks. 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 Nice, Thanks. To, nice to see you from Italy. Uh, I have a question here from Larry Woolover, uh, a good friend of mine. Uh, hey, Larry, if you're watching. Uh, he says uh, he's got a distribution of workload uh, question. I have three machines, they're all PCs, all linked together, Mm. that I can use uh, for music. One, it's an older 32 gig i7 chip, 64K machine. I wonder what he means by the 64K. Yeah, that's... That would be really old if I was thinking what it's... Yeah, I don't think it is. It's not like a Nintendo 64 or anything. (laughs) Let's skip the 64K that I'm using as a server with backup attached. Uh, two, a uh, more recent 32 gig, gig um, Intel chip has all my samples and feeds the audio with backup attached. And three, a new 64 gig i9, 4.35 gigahertz. Whew. Wow, this is a nice machine. Whoa, Ooh. is that a pro? Uh, uh, or is it PC? No, I do PC. Yeah, oh, okay. that I'm using presently for my day job with the data on the server. I can move the music software, samples and audio, to any machine I wish. Presently, everything's on computer, too. And I have VEP and 7 when it's released that I use. The question is, how would you distribute the workload, project files, and sample inventory between the computers? Thank you in advance for any wisdom you can share. Hmm. Well, I mean, I think you did a really good job at it. I think that you know your DAW machine, well, now, now that I think about it, you probably want to put VEP, this you want to turn that really powerful machine into your server. So you want the, the i9 to be your VEP server. You want your weakest computer to be your DAW. This is like kind of contrary to what you might think, but yeah. because the server is going to be doing the main load of serving up all those samples and doing all that real-time data access and everything. That one, the souped-up machine, should be your sample server. As far as project files, um, they can go anywhere, even on an external 7200 RPM drive, or you don't need an SSD for that. Uh, so um, you might use that other machine that's like in between uh, power between those three uh, for perhaps like a Mirror Pro server, or um, you know you could turn that into your Pro Tools machine, so you could do live stem printing, uh, synced across uh, the two computers. Yeah, that's what I would think. Is yeah. You have one that's running the samples and one that's just for bouncing, you know, so that you can keep keep going with your samples if something's bouncing or anything like that, or you can yeah. move it off. Yeah, a lot of people do uh, exporting of stems. Some people call that bouncing, 
but technically it's not because bouncing is, bouncing is a term that used to be in multi-track recording <laughs> where you take let's say seven tracks of an eight track recording and then you mix bounce them all down to the eighth track and then you erase those other seven tracks so now you have seven more so now you can do six tracks with a blank track and then you can have so so seven, six, five, four, three, right. two, one. You can turn an eight-track okay. machine into a whatever that is. It's e X factorial or something. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Um, In any event, bouncing—that's what bouncing is. It 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 refers to more like real-time bouncing out of all of your of all of your music. Except bouncing on DAWs now these days has been. Exporting. It really means kind of exporting. It's like, okay, it just right. means bounce all my, just means export all my tracks individually uh, out to files, each one a different file. That's technically not bouncing. So we sort of like hmm. call the process that you want to do uh, when you're a film composer is called printing stems. And so when you're um, trying to get your stems done, uh, you you play your music and then you record the outputs all onto different tracks live, and that can be done. That can tax your computer if the one computer is playing back and recording. Right, right. So if you have like 150 tracks playing back, you need 150 tracks recording at the same time. So that's why, Larry, I recommend that possibly you use that other computer as a printing stems computer, a Pro Tools computer, machine, MIDI machine control synced back so that it'll just always be in perfect sync and you can just print stems over there all day long. And the cool thing about having another computer doing that is you can punch in and out. So if you had a glitch in any one particular spot in your printing stem, 150 tracks of stems, but there was like one spot that it glitched, you can just go back. It's already printed in your Pro Tools session. You can go back and rewind to that right moment, rewind a little bit more if you've got MIDI that needs to catch up, MIDI CC information. Hit play, the other one syncs over there, it starts playing at the same time, and you just hit record for the moment where it glitched, and then record out, and you've punched in and out, and you've put like a little punch in and out of there, and then you can you can uh, use Pro Tools to, what do they call it, when you uh, kind of like make it one file whole again. Oh, heal? Oh yeah, yeah. heal. It's yeah. kind of heal, but it's not heal, it's another thing. Uh, consolidate? Where consolidate, Sorry. thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, Larry, by I hope the, that helps you out. Yeah. By the way, Evan, I've seen this bounce stems in place. What's, I've seen that a lot. Maybe oh, bounce stems in place is exactly what you what you need to be doing. That just means okay. uh, the faders. Don't change the faders. Don't change the volumes, nothing. It means when you take all your stems and you put them back into any system, let's say Pro Tools or Cubase or Logic or any audio mixing system, and you put all those stems in there, then it's going to sound in combination exactly the same mm -hmm. as it did when it came out of your computer that's mm -hmm. what it means in place like don't don't be normalizing them no pre no pre fader bouncing <laughs> you know give me give yeah, me no everything that that track normalize. is yeah never normalize and never auto level when you're bouncing stems so yeah that's what that means uh, bounce in place there's a lot of different ways they say that too <laughs> fader zero stuff like that yeah <laughs> Yeah. When you're printing stems, you want to do it like that. Yeah. If I remember, too, there's a specific function in Logic where if you're working and you have this MIDI region, you can bounce in place and you'll get an audio region and a new track underneath, which then you can manipulate just like you would any audio file. Mm -hmm. uh, some people use it, like, to freeze audio tracks, um, you know, and stuff like that, so they can work on different stuff, but... You know, it's just a just another tool in your toolbox. I was actually going to ask before we move on. Um, d uh, does does your friend have to worry at all about um, like multi-threading, like having different processors or Pro Tools? I don't think I mean, he's using Logic. Uh, if that's what you're getting. Yeah. At. Are there any DAWs that have the eight that CPU have, has yeah. the lo the CPU leak problem? Yeah, or they they don't know how to divide up between the different processors. I don't, I don't remember if that's still a thing or if we. I mean, if you're using um, VEP at the blockbuster movie level, <laughs> you know you probably don't want to be using Logic. Uh, you m m even Cubase, you know, Logic has a couple of things that make it really difficult to work with 
gigantic exter- external massive tunneled cabling. <laughs> mm-hmm. That environment is just the, ugly. It's called the environment, and it's, um, it's, a, it's a you can get around it, but you know void. you're going to have to know how because all of the templates that are out there all have like messed up flaws in them and stuff, and you've got to fix them. And if you don't know how to fix them, and you're not a programmer, um, you might not be able to do it. So if you want an easy time in film scoring, go with Digital Performer. Um, gosh, I would kind of stop there. <laughs> but, you know, of course, you know, Cubase is, is, is maybe an inch better than Logic um, for that reason, for a powerful external like VEP cabling. Um, but Logic is the easiest and fastest program to use. So it doesn't necessarily zippy. mean that it's going to give you all the great workflow things that you need for breaking a movie score. So, you know. I use them all, but uh, I prefer Digital Performer when it comes to film scoring because of its ability to handle all of the music all at once, all of the cues that you have to write. Yeah, Kyle, did you have something you were going to talk about? Yeah, I have kind of a kind of a crazy out there theory, but it's just noticing trends in the uh, industry right now. <laughs> crazy theories, crazy theories, <laughs> conspiracy theories. Yeah, okay, yeah. conspiracy theory, Kyle. Mm, um, Tower Seven. I mean, it's, it's kind of a broad question, too, and we may have even covered it slightly before in different podcasts, but I mean, just seeing how, yeah. I mean, especially how you guys compose as well, using all MIDI, you know, and I'm always curious if we're ever going to come to a point where we're going to kind of, the live musician, the live orchestra will become obsolete in its own right, you know, just because this, mm. just your, how how advanced the uh, control will become, you know, will become for MIDI. Uh, I mean, just my experiences, I mean, I just actually just found a, uh, a MIDI guitar plugin where it, it, you normally they don't sound very natural. It's very, you know, automated. You can kind of tell. And this was one of the clear, I think it was called Odin. It was like a metal uh, kind of specialty plug-in, but it was it's one of the best MIDI guitar I've ever heard in my life. It was all programmed. So I, 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 I'm curious, because I mean, even looking back 10 years, people turn their nose up to drum programs or stuff such like that, you know, uh, you know, um, drum MIDI programs, you could do your own thing. So I'm just curious if you guys ever think that that really will happen. We will just kind of go the route of, you know, almost like the EDM. I think this, with everyone being so raised on that now, and that's been such a popular thing, everyone's so used to hearing their music perfect all the time. Like, that machine kind of precision, and that, you know, that very overly produced, always replicated sound, it's always going to be, you know, the same. I missed I missed the beginning of that, so the question? Oh, so kind of, basically, kind of, if you think live musicians will ever really do become obsolete. Oh, I see live musicians will ever live, become well, obsolete. Well, yeah. 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 Back, I mean, back in the day, the, uh, this is a great topic. <laughs> Let's yeah. go over this. Awesome. <laughs> so, so back in the day, the uh, the serpent was the main um, accompaniment instrument from the beginning. For choirs, yeah. From the you, you know, like, well, Adam and probably like. Yeah, I was thinking when you said that. They, <laughs> they called him and uh, turned him into an instrument. Uh, I'm talking like uh, medieval Renaissance age. The serpent was kind of a tuba type, half bassoon thingy that accompanied the orchestra, and then came. You know the uh, the actual like bassoon and tuba, and then you know if you look at the first keyboard synthesizer ever, that was the pipe organ with all its different colorful stops, you know, right. stops right. and stuff like that. And then you got the you know computer. I, I forget the name. It's just like its own computer with samples, and you have to buy the rack. And then we moved on to uh, actual software samples. Okay. So we we're just always evolving, right? Right. You know, and I assume the same as with with any instrument, really. Um, as far as um, you know, like the overproduced thing, I think that's a, a style. Okay. And I was actually watching a video this morning by Rick Beato who talked about that uh, rock music saw its decline in the early two thousands um, in coincidence with the appearance of things like uh, quantization and uh, pitch control, where they were taking these drum grooves that um, naturally don't sit exactly on the grid and turning them into this quantized thing and so then people stop listening to it. So I think that kind of stuff, I don't think that hyper-produced idea is going to really overtake because just uh, as a stylistic function, it, you know, people still want the, uh, the authentic feel. It's, it's right. um, functionally different and people can discern that. Okay. Yeah, okay. So that's, that's my, uh, my thought on that. But you know, if in the future the, uh, the best oboe you can buy is you know some wind synthesizer patch with you know all the controls and it sounds better than a real oboe and you never have to wet your reed you know I'm sure there are people who would either learn the oboe as children or would be oboe doublers who would pick that up instead 
Okay. Yeah, so I can see that getting replaced, even though they're still performers. Right, right. I mean, because I always go off just the topic of just, you know, impulse responses that become so much more advanced, you know, as well. I mean, like I said, going for, like, just say, like, a drum program maybe 15 years ago was very, you know, usually most drum MIDI was just, you could tell, it was just very, very, that was kind of a style. It kind of became its own style, MIDI drums. And, but now we have programs where people will do whole entire albums, you know, especially just as actual just musicians, you know, not totally film composers themselves, but people will do whole albums with just nothing but just, you know, drum samples. And you know, you know, and it's, as I said a couple years ago, people would scoff at that idea. So it's, it's interesting to me how it kind mm -hmm. of keeps turn, changing and evolving, and we're getting now to where it's like, you don't have to be a, you know, you don't have to even have an actual drummer, you don't have to be a drummer, you can just, you know, do it all yourself, and it's just, I just find it interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's just like the, uh, you know, if you have this uh, distribution of I, let's just say talent or craft within an industry. There's always the upper echelon that's, you know, just incredibly well done, virtuosic. And then you have the middle range, you know, the working professional, and then you have the amateur, which is the bottom end. Right. And with the advent of, you know, digital technology that's cheaper, it's more accessible, it's easier to use, you know, it maintains itself pretty well. All you see really is um, you can almost a skew to that distribution to that bottom line just because more people enter, not the fact that the people at the top start using that stuff more. It's just right. there's more people at the bottom using it. Yeah, you right, can almost right. call the, the music of today that's made by, let's say, um, untrained musicians uh, is sort of like the gypsy music of today, you know? Hmm. But, uh, you know, eventually gypsy qualities and gypsy music got into classical music and right. trained music and Ravel Sagan. You know, so it, yeah, it eventually it eventually trickles up. Right, right. You know? Yeah, we kinda there's that like that home producer that does beats, you know, and that that's probably a, a style that's already influencing uh, more trained styles of music as well. Yeah. In nineteen seventy two my dad uh, answered this same question. Oh very <laughs> cool. Okay. So I'm gonna pull that up now. Let me get the uh, screen screen up here so I can share it with you guys. There we go. E position so I. So the whole album is this one composition. One composition. It's it's sort of George's album. It features me quite. A bit. How do you feel about the music today, the, the rock music? Rock music. Well, I don't know how to put you know putting it into a category. Generally speaking, I'd say what is called rock. There's a lot of uh, transient music going on. I mean, it, it's here today and gone tomorrow, and uh, a lot of it doesn't have a lot of experience or talent behind it. But then again. There's uh, certain things in the rock field which are very creative and uh, and swinging and whatnot, as in any other field of music. So I think it's all coming together uh, more now. And I think the people that maybe would have been satisfied with just uh, a rock feeling now want sort of the same beat, but they want a more sophisticated thing happening on top of it. And so their interest is moving toward jazz, you know, which has been running through the stream all the time anyhow. Mm -hmm. So I think jazz is coming back stronger and it probably will use a lot of rock elements and naturally rock is using jazz elements as in a lot of jazz rock bands and, and everything is kind of getting together. I think the, the scene for jazz is getting stronger than right now. Getting and, and jazz is becoming more and more electronic too. Right. And even the saxophones yeah. and trumpets. Right. And I don't think that really means anything uh, other than a uh, very kind of temporary uh, uh, gimmicky sound appeal. You know, somebody can get one strong record by doing a new, a new gimmick, you know, electronic gimmick. But it's the man behind the instrument, whether it's electronic or acoustic or what, it's going to be the mind that's behind the music that's going to make it, you know, good and make it last. So. Interesting. Oh, there okay. you go. Okay. From his lips to God's ears, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, what do you think about that? You know? I do. I, I think he's got a point there. It's it, it doesn't matter if it's a guy behind a computer, or a guy behind a guitar. It's it's the mind. Mm -hmm. It's what's, what's who's creating it. It's you know. I mean, I I do. I think that's I think that's kind of where it's going to keep going. Um, but even just seeing how far I mean AI has come and how it can kind of hold its own and. I'm curious to kind of hear that. You know what I mean? Like just to kind of see. You go to a, a, a 
a live orchestra and it's all oh, robots yeah. in a way. I mean, not to be too, you know, all <laughs> robots and they actually wrote it. It's not something that, oh, they're playing a piece by Beethoven. No, they, yeah. this is a piece they wrote. They're going to perform it, you know, and it's huh. going to be... You know what was cool you know, is uh, a friend of mine, uh, Jose Valise. You know Jose, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. He just recently uh, did the first audience-controlled orchestral performance. So everyone on their phone downloads this app, yeah. and everyone in the audience then votes during the thing, as things are coming up on the screen, do you want the oboe to play this next line? Do you want the viola? <laughs> oh do you want this next line to do this or that? Right, right. Wow. And the music kind of writes itself from, from pre-possibilities, depending okay. on how the audience wishes it to come out. Oh my gosh. Pretty darn cool. That's, that's interesting. Way I to always, go, Jose. That was really awesome. You blew me away with that one. I've always yeah, thought of something yeah. like that, having like a crowd-controlled kind of soundtrack in a way. You Absolutely. Know, and you're, and you're, exactly, you're picking out, like, oh, let's, let's have this do this part. Yeah. Let's, let's cut that. You know, it's, that's really so talk about, you know, So talk about you know, uh, putting it into the mind of the, of the creator. Right. Well, now, all of a sudden, you're giving the whole audience yeah. the ability to make those choices. And that could probably... That was just the first practical example a recent concert that he did you know I'm sure years from now we're going to get down to the point where people are <laughs> perhaps they're even writing in the little musical parts from their chair right. and it's flying into the like next movement and everything and being um, you know written that's, that's fascinating <laughs> live yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I could see it where uh, I, I mean we're already there but I'm just waiting for the technology to get more accessible those um, uh, what do they call electronic ink you know music notation Yes. You, you just have a program set up that, you know, as the input changes, then when the page is supposed to turn, then it's just whatever music is, you know, called for based on the conditions of the vote or what the yeah. condu conductor chooses. You know, conductor to say, okay, we're jumping to Q number six, so mm -hmm. the next page is going to be Q six. Yeah. You don't have to worry about it. Just play what you see. Oh, yeah. That'd be great for, for live shows, too, like uh, the Academy Awards or something, you know, where you've got to f vamp something. Mm -hmm. And it needs a few more bars because the guy's right. kissing everybody and walking on everybody's head, <laughs> like yeah. Roberto Benini when he was coming up to the stage. <laughs> so you need a little more time. So then you can, you know, can actually like auto write that, and fly that in. So yeah. Uh, some of the guys have some questions over here. Let's okay, take a look. Cool. Uh, I'm writing a track for a game demo and using three-part counterpoint. How much is too much to take away from the action? Rob Burnley <laughs> asked that, that question. Hi, Rob. Hey. <laughs> any, do you have any I, ideas of what to tell them? I think that uh, what you ought to think about, you know, is go roll back to what is the purpose of this this action. Mm -hmm. You know, what? Why? Why should the action exist? Why? You know, why does this action? Why is this happening? What's the conflict here? And who needs to get through it, right? And then, and then um, assign your counterpoint to to the stuff that's going on. You know, um, it's three part counterpoint. Me, just that doesn't really tell me enough. <laughs> yeah, it, it could be like you have, you know, three layers of music, and layer one, you know, it's like the bass track, and then layer two and three can be added on or mixed in as the, you know. Uh, play, playing gets more intense. Yeah. You know, so y you would figure out then what is the uh, game state that would trigger these different events. And then you would s you'd listen and say, okay, well, if, you know, 80% action is layer two, then how much excitement is does, you know, layer two need to have? So, yeah, like just like you said, it's a function. You have to think of um, what the music is actually doing in the game. And with games, it's it's a lot about the triggers and the game state and the what you're doing as a player at that moment. Yeah, so, but if it's like a, like a broke counterpoint, I don't know. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what I was worried about. Crossing. Exactly. <laughs> that's that's what I was worried about. But like my idea is, you know, just assign the different counterpoints to different elements of the conflict, you know? Mm -hmm. Just like you just said, you know, exactly, you know? So, you know, if there's, if there's an enemy in this action thing, you know, maybe that's the second counterpoint line and it's going do 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 you know, it's this constant stressful force that's upon the music. And then you have the hero, the hero, you know, in the midst of all that on the main line going, 
you know, it's doing something heroic and you do 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 going on underneath and the enemy counterpoint and the third counterpoint line, oh no, there's somebody you gotta rescue and there's something going on, boom, 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 and it's increasing the person's, you know, you gotta get to that person before they, uh, what not, you know, but uh, yeah, so. That's pretty cool that there's a purpose to what you're writing and it's yes. connected to what the movie's saying. Yes. So the, the bad guy's there, you, yes. it's not just like, you're not oh, just, oh, yeah. that's so cool, counterpoint. Yeah. It goes yeah. back to what I was saying, and maybe that's why he asked it, which is think first, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and then create what you want to create after, because everything that you put on that page, it should be assigned to a purpose and a reason. Yeah, mm -hmm. it should make it better. You should feel sorry about, you know, the music that you're writing, and you're wondering, am I writing, you know, enough, or am I writing too much of the bad music that they're going to get mad at me? I want to write just enough of the bad music. To you know, get it approved or whatever, but it sh it's it should be yeah. the other way around, you right. know. And maybe maybe you got to think what um, too much means. Maybe it's you know you set some parameters. There's a dialogue moment, so you're you're aware that you can't conflict with the dialogue. So that's a a bar that you can judge your music against. Will it work with the dialogue, or is it you know the certain uh, motion? Maybe the character is moving at a certain speed, and the music has to match that. So there's another bar. Are you slowing down at certain moments when the action is constant? You know, stuff like that. So maybe you figure out your parameters and then it's pretty easy to judge. I just want to add, yeah, sure. I want to add just one thing to that too that I've been hearing you say a lot is don't like just jump into the music. I know a lot of composers, they just want to write notes on the, on the page and really take your time and understand it might not even need counterpoint. Maybe you want something much more sim right. simple and don't just get mar married to that idea. Yeah, I see where That's you're going with that. It's like, you know, maybe try some different music that pre it's pre-existing up against that scene first and see, you know, does one look cliche? Does one, I mean, you know, I've, I estimate that I've seen somewhere around 20,000 movies in my life as I've worked, which is a lot, by the way. It's like three <laughs> or five movies a day for about 15 years. <laughs> And so, um, you know, maybe you don't have that sense yet, you know, but so you, you're going to have to maybe put some pre-existing examples and mm -hmm. see, you know, where's your maturity level with this? Uh, is that, you know, going to be just something that's interesting and good or is it really doing something fresh and new, you know? So, yeah, yeah, and you can do that before you spend all the time writing it and working it out. You know, the worst thing you can do is think after you write music. <laughs> think first <laughs> now Dallas uh, a couple yeah. weeks ago uh, we talked about uh, the dangers of upgrading our OS's and our machines and I yeah. know you recently uh, went from uh, I believe El Capitan yeah. oh. uh, tested out Sierra ran into a few problems with support and then went up to high Sierra is that right yep yeah. So, uh, can you talk about uh, anything you know that experience and um, yeah it the was programs you use and anything that yeah, it was, was it was just a it was just a I was just trying to get Microsoft Office actually, um, and so I looked up the minimum operating requirements for that, and it was listed Sierra as the minimum, um, but through the tech support, it it, it turns out there's a, kind of a licensing issue, like a known licensing issue where it can't verify, and you get the spinning wheel and all this stuff. So uh, we we tried a few things, but I ended up going to High Sierra. Now before that. Um, I did some research. You can look up uh, Sweetwater has a, a list um, for every operating system of what programs work with it. Um, like I checked out the Mojave because maybe I wanted Mojave, but I, I saw there were some um, compatibility issues. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, so they have like a compatibility uh, chart. Yeah, yeah. It's like uh -huh. it's it's listed by companies, so you'll see like you know Avid, and they've got the different products that they know about Avid, or and the, and sometimes it's based off. And that's at sweetwater.com? Like press release. Yeah, you can just uh, search it and you'll probably find it. So, you know, I checked out the Mojave list, the uh, High Sierra list, the Sierra list, and then I asked, you know, different people that I knew um, were involved with uh, different programs, you know, like Sibelius or Dorico or something like that. So I knew that if they didn't have any problems, I probably wouldn't have any problems either. You know, ask the people who are really involved and really know the guts of the program. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't. So ask, at this point, uh, uh, was there anything that you had to sacrifice, or everything's good? Um, I th I think everything's pretty good. There might be a little bit of a flex time issue with uh, Logics, with uh, with Logic Pro, um, you know, with the with the audio editing and something. But they say that's every system. So so far, it's pretty good. Okay. 
Um, and I do, I, I'm probably tonight I'll be testing that out. I'm doing some like sound effect stuff and I'll be stretching. And <laughs> so we'll, we'll see if I pull out more hair. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so far so good. Awesome. Uh, let's see, we have a question from the live stream. Uh, Francesco uh, Benelli says, uh, you talked about making a soundtrack functional. To me, it happens more times to receive requests to compose music for videos not even yet completed. For picture, not, mm. not yet completed. <clears throat> How should I behave with these customers? Mm. So, um, you know, the modern film composer has to work hard. Mm -hmm. Let's start there, okay, <laughs> with this one. Uh, so you can do as little as you like. Um, I don't recommend that though. You know, it's a, it's a hugely competitive field out there. And if you want to survive and you want to do this as a career and you be a professional, uh, you really do have to work quite hard uh, because you've got a lot of competition. So along these lines, yeah, I recommend if you can get in early like that and you've signed contracts, then uh, start writing. Start writing, start getting ideas going. Uh, sometimes you can be more creative and bring more creative concepts to the table that early. And then when, and it might, it may even influence how they shoot the movie. And then when you're ready to provide the score for the, the film, it's already, um, you know, amazingly fitting because you've already preconceived it with the filmmakers and the film it's true. in mind. And they've even maybe changed, you know, some, I know that like, you know, Hans Zimmer gets on like early like that. So, you know, this is not, not an unheard of thing. Um, I often sign on early like that and uh, start creating examples and we start right away you know as soon as, soon as you can start writing start writing you know I don't think you know yes it, it, as a professional you should be able to do your job in 30 days you know full score right. full orchestra conducted and mixed down and soundtrack pressed you know but you know don't have an ego about it I mean as an artist and, and for the audience's sake and for the filmmaker's sake and the relationship's sake and the entire process and what kind of the art and craft of film scoring and the art you know and the boundaries that you can take it to uh, you can start putting in the 90 days of extra time you might have or, or half a year sometimes it can be um, and start advancing the creative concepts that you know be bringing to the table for that. So I highly recommend you do that, especially to stay competitive, to stay fresh, to enrich in your relationships with these filmmakers, and enrich in your relationship with the audience that's going to watch that movie. You know, right. you're not going to think up as good of an ideas in 30 days as you are in six months. You're going to have the time to more deeply explore things. You know. It's yeah. the difference between Interstellar and Pirates of the Caribbean. You know, he had like 27 days to do Pirates of the Caribbean versus, you know, a year to do Interstellar, you know. Oh, and and look at the result. It's, it's profound. It's not even deep. It's profound. <laughs> Interstellar. The music. The use of the music hits levels that are, you know, that break the fourth wall of cinema mentally, you know, psychologically. Uh, Pirates of the Caribbean does not do that. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, too, it's almost like a matter of perspective. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when you're working with a filmmaker and you could consider, oh, by the moment they have a finished locked cut t as a starting point to the moment that they need everything f you know, fully mixed and rendered and ready to go is one amount of time and maybe... You know, for some people that could be like five days, and so getting in on a project before that, where the film is not yet completed, you're getting extra time to work on that project. So, you know, maybe it's just a matter of perspective. Saying I, I'll take this in 45 days, you know, if it means I have to do a few revisions at the very end, instead of doing the whole thing in five days with a locked cut, you know, something like that. Yeah. Now, is that common to for composers too to actually kind of work alongside the actual production of the film, like while it's being created, so they can kind of get an idea 
you know, better as to how the soundtrack's going to go. So they're, they're seeing the film and they're seeing the scenes kind of, you know, take shape and take form. Is that is that kind of common or is no. it more? No, it's not okay. It's not common. It's not common. It's kind of, it does um, happen, it's just not. But it ought to be that way and it can be that way. Okay. But not if you, you know, if you're just dicking around. I mean, you got to have something to contribute, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's probably something for when you're more advanced. Okay. And you know how to think. Right. Um, you know, because... So, yeah. Why be on the set, for example, um, if all you're thinking about is music? Right. Okay. Mm. okay. So that's not really useful. You know? But if you're, but if you guys are like a hand-in-hand -hand storytelling team, right, right. You know, uh, that's that's more important. You know, like your understanding, like where your cues are going to start. Essentially, like just by doing this, you know, okay, I'll start right here. And, you know, it's not the beginning, but maybe a little, a little more afterwards. Or oh, I want to kick in right here. Or, or another thing that can happen is, know. is sometimes. Um, there's research time, you know. It could be a, a score set somewhere, mm -hmm. you know? right? Right. Um, maybe Finland or something, and so you know you have all this extra time. Now you can, you know, if it's a big blockbuster movie, there should be even a travel budget. You should be able to go there, research <coughs> instruments, research, yeah. you know, uh, instrumentation, research. Uh, musicians that you might be able to bring on board as soloists, right, research right. research the areas, just be inspired, you know, and uh, check out the history of maybe that story, you know, so that can get you hitting, you know, make your music more meaningful. Okay, mm. okay. You know, putting yourself in that realm, essentially. You're yeah. Getting, getting that, all those influences and all those, uh, the idea too of that, that kind of strikes me when you go there and you're say it is like a certain time period piece or it's just a certain culture kind of piece and it's like yeah you're you're you are going to want to look for musicians who play those instruments in that area obviously you know mm -hmm. i mean you're just for the that, that reminds me of um harry gregson williams did a discussion about um this uh irish film i think it was about you know like the irish what is it like ipc or something the uh, the bombers oh yeah, oh, and the, yeah. the civil unrest from i don't know how many years ago and he ended up finding this uh, boy on the street who was just singing, you know, like a beggar. And he had a voice. So then he took that boy and recorded the, the boy's oh, voice and put it into the score. Oh, wow. So that, that was something, you know, that kind of research. Very interesting. Uh, mm. That bore fruit. I don't remember the name of the movie, but it was a great mm. cue. That's cool. Well, if you remember the name, we'll post it into the description later. I don't know if there's an answer to this, Evan. Maybe you can kind of um, explore this. But should you be, as a composer should you be looking with movies uh with longer deadlines or shorter deadlines maybe it's you could really get a good sound if you have like two months to compose something or, as well, opposed to like five, well, ten days or there are composers like um uh, well there are composers who prefer to work on one or two movies a year you know mm. take a very deep relaxed focused meditative approach to creating mm -hmm. that score you know and they can put out some of the best works uh, well, like John Crigliano is one that just like, I mean, look at the Red Violin. It's mm -hmm. it's like a classical masterpiece, a symphony, you know. And um, it must have taken him probably half a year to write that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I don't think you could do that in in a, in a month. <laughs> but uh, you know, I don't know. You know, so some composers maybe they're looking for that. You know, that, mm -hmm. oh really? Are you only going to give me a month? Oh yeah, that's not my cup of tea. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm yeah. a, kind of a more meaningful composer <laughs> than that or something. <laughs> Um, but you know, uh, different strokes for different folks. You know, I think you know. I like to do. I like to do, uh, whether it's twenty days or ninety days, just great projects. And, yes. You know, mm. I think sometimes you don't have a lot of time on great projects because mm. you know they've been working so hard creatively on all the creative decisions, and they might have even just thrown off a composer and only have fifteen days left. You know, mm. and so. Um, those can be some of the best situations out there, and there's very little time. So mm. I wouldn't. So I wouldn't. you have to be good at anything that comes your way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Workflow. Yeah, have a ton of different workflow uh, workflows uh, mm. that you can like uh, bring. So you know, one I, that's at the beginning. I am always, you know, setting a workflow out. That's one of the first things you got to do. And so if it's a fast project, I know, oh, boom, you know, within mm. the next three hours, I need to hire, you know, six orchestrators and <laughs> the entire copyist mm. team, and I'm probably going to need some sub-composing help and, um, you know, mock-up engineers, and, and we're, we're going to have to do this as fast, tight team, you know. <laughs> if I have 90 days, you know, 
probably don't even need an orchestrator and uh, can do it all myself um, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. in Sibelius and uh, won't even need copyists. You know, so, mm. so yeah. it work it changes the workflow, changes Workflow, everything. Yeah. Yeah, time and how you decide to do your workflow can can make or break things. You yeah. know. Uh, now, Monica Mia asks. Uh, she says, hello, everyone. What is your approach to doing a, a piano-only uh, soundtrack? Yeah. And, and she says she's talking about sound mostly in the cases where recording on a grand piano is not an option, like which sample libraries do you go for? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it does open up a nice discussion just about piano in soundtracks. And uh, I thought we could go there. And uh, um, we could also recommend a couple uh, piano sample libraries uh, at the end of that as well. Yeah, I'm curious of uh, why the parameter is piano only. Um, right. Is the director requesting it? Right, because um, that's... And how set is the director in that request? Or is it just the director's way of requesting some emotion or, you know, textural feel that you could easily build on with other instruments? So, curious about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, hopefully there's a reason for the piano only soundtrack. I, I, I'm sure there is, because that's, that's pretty unique. Piano in general is overused in orchestral scoring. Um, I was taught, you know, you need to have a reason to use piano, because for instance, a piano is a percussion instrument in which you strike the string and it decays, and you can't get it to crescendo unless you do trill and pianistic things. You have to do pianistic things in order for it to do more than, say, a vibraphone. You know, which is boom. That's all pianos do. You strike the note, and then they decay. Everything else that you do with that piano is pianistic, and the fact that you have ten fingers playing it. You know, mm -hmm. so that brings a lot of baggage to the equation. And when you start to be pianistic then you start to bring the history of piano into the into the narrative and so if there isn't a reason to bring the history of the piano into the narrative uh, that can really get in the way people will notice that you're bringing this quality of like this aristocratic high-class instrument uh, over the last 200 years you know into this narrative and why are we doing that you know it worked in like for instance the movie the fern by Dave Grusin because, you know, being a, a lawyer paid back then, 20 years ago, $250,000 a year just as a rookie, you know, was, you, you pretty much hit the high class. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so to score the whole movie with piano just sort of like made it kind of yuppie and like high class and kind of mixed all that together and, and it brought the baggage in the proper way, you know, but he did some very cool like eight track recording where he could do action. He was like slapping the piano and strumming oh, the strings cool. and doing multi-tracking. The whole score is piano, but... It's Tom Cruise? It, it, yeah, Tom Cruise. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and Dave Houston did that score. Um, but, you know, so... But if you, you if you bring piano into, a, into an ordinary orchestral score, just, just for spice, it's going to be a problem unless you use it in an orchestral way, which Jerry Goldsmith was pretty oh. good at. You know, you can bang really hard on the bottom notes of the piano and get oh, a very aggressive great. metallic sound. You can use the very high end of the piano to create like a raindrop, you know, so effect, so for maybe tears, for teardrops, you know, you can sound like a harp almost, you know. Mm. It's um, almost like you want to focus on the extremes and then yeah. only as you're forced to move towards the center. Yeah. Because the, uh, the center is just kind of, you know, boring. and Yeah. The, the other thing too about piano is it's just out of tune. Like as well as you tune a piano, it's still right. not, you can't tune it on the fly. Right. And so everything it does is... Equal you temperament. Know, yeah, you hit it, and that's that's what you get. So, um, if you have too much of it, then it's going to sour up a lot of the uh, the sweet harmonies of you know orchestral and like musicians and like stuff like that. Yeah. Now, in the case of uh, what libraries to use, if you uh, you know, so we went over whether or not you should use piano or not. So let's say you you realize yes, this is a score that piano is going to be fantastic. You know, um, and 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 then her question is, you know, if you can't mic a real piano. What sample libraries would you go for? And uh, you know, I recommend I use the um, Alicia's Keys, uh, but you could check out like the 8DO Steinway scoring piano. That's a really beautiful piano. Um, Spitfire Labs piano. That's another good one. And uh, somebody else recommends Addictive Keys. I don't know. I haven't played I don't that, know one. About that one. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, what, what's that uh, That blues piano? The oh, uh, jazzy piano. Right. Uh, piano in Blue, I believe yeah, it's called. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's yeah. literally that they went in and sampled that piano because <laughs> my dad made it famous in the movie, in the movie, in the soundtrack, in the uh, album, oh. Kind of Blue. Yeah. With uh, Miles Davis, yeah, that's nice. And it's very soft and, and mellow and, and warm, and the attacks feel like I really have wide. to thank those guys. I think it, I, I'm trying to remember. I think it was Cine Samples. I could be wrong about that, but I have to thank those guys because it was the day they were gonna move that piano out of there, and they sold the studio and everything. And they went, wait, 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 wait. Let's get in there and let's sample that. That's you know, phenomenal piano. And uh, yeah, if you want to like play as close as possible in style to my dad, and, and you can. Grab that piano and blues, pull it up, and then play. Whoo! It's like you're you're right on the album. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a lot softer. The Alicia Keys is a pretty bright piano. Yeah, she uses it for pop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's good. It has a good range, a good dynamic range, and it covers the whole yeah. board. And it does have sympathetic resonance. Um, in case you don't know what sympathetic resonance is, that's when the other strings on the piano vibrate whenever uh, one note is played. And you can test that by holding down another note uh, at zero velocity so it doesn't play, but now the hammer uh, is, uh, the mute uh, is open, so the string would resonate, and then you play like two octaves down below really hard, boom, like that, and you'll hear that, that string will be ringing. So that's a good test you can use to see if a piano library is really worth its salt, <laughs> sympathetic resonance. Well guys, I think we had a really great show today. Yeah. I hope everyone awesome. enjoyed it. Yes, <laughs> that was awesome. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for showing up and asking all your great questions. Thanks, guys. <laughs>